Good morning, Cedar Mountain Baptist Church. I hope you're doing well, and whoever may be watching this alongside of us, uh, we have decided to go to online services, and uh, we feel that that's the best way to be obedient and to be a good steward of what the government has asked us to do at this time. And so by way of giving you a sense of normalcy, I've decided to record this here at the church uh, and kind of give you a feel of what it would be like here uh, on a Sunday morning, any given Sunday morning, if you might want to attend in the future, uh, being with us here at Cedar Mountain Baptist Church, we'd love to have you with us. I'd like to just make a few announcements as we get started uh, before we give the sermon for today or this week. Uh, I want you to I want to let you know that we have decided to cancel all of our remaining services and events for the month of March. And so next week also, there will be a video, much like this one, uploaded for you to be able to watch through Facebook or uh, through YouTube as well. And feel free to share these with whoever you would like to do that with uh, as a way to encourage them and help them through this crisis that we're going through. And uh, also, we will, re we will meet back April the 1st to reevaluate things and see where we stand and see what measures need to be taken at that time and kind of uh, reevaluate the situation. And we will let you know. Uh, many of you got a call uh, from our on-call system. This is a new system that we put in place over the week. And uh, if you have not gotten a call from that, please call me uh, directly or call the church office and we'll get you added to that list as our way to communicate. We want to try to communicate as effectively as we can. So if you're interested in receiving a call about future messages uh, and updates as we, as we move forward uh, through this time, uh, feel free to give me a call and I'll add you to that list. That will be our way to try to communicate to everybody as a mass production, as a mass way to communicate uh, through the next few weeks. Also, I want to mention to you that you can also continue to give your tithes and offerings. And you can do that a couple different ways. One, uh, you can come by the church office on Fridays between 9.30 and 5.30. And uh, Miss Susie Guffey will be here and some of our administrative staff will be here and you can come and drop that off uh, throughout the day on Friday. Or you can drop it in the mail addressed to Cedar Mountain Baptist Church, P.O. Box 367, Cedar Mountain, North Carolina, 28718. Uh, and we'll make sure that that gets accounted for and that you uh, have a receipt for that as well. So uh, please continue to give. Uh, we need those ties to make sure everything operates uh, for the church month to month. So hopefully you'll uh, prayerfully consider what the Lord would have you to do there. If you have any further questions, or concerns about anything along the way, uh, I hope that you feel free to call me and uh, contact me and I'll try to get you the best answer I can get to you. And if you need anything or if you know of anybody that needs anything, uh, we're still in the ministry. We're still uh, meeting people at their point of need and sharing Christ. And that's what we want to do. So if, if we could be of any help, please reach out to a church member or you can reach out to me personally and we will try to get that need taken care of. Well, as we approach our text this morning, uh, I'd like to just pray like we normally would do if the congregation was filled uh, here today, and just take a moment and ask the Lord to help us as we understand this text. Hopefully your Bibles are open to 1 Peter, and we'll get there in just a moment. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help as we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, as we are meeting in homes all across Transylvania County and maybe even other counties this morning, Lord, I just pray that you would be with us that you would help us to understand the text. Lord, I pray that you would use this text to speak to our hearts. I pray that we would apply this text to our lives. And Lord, I pray that as we live out this text, that we will show people the light and love of Jesus and reflect that. Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we open your word this morning. Help us to uh, understand it properly and know that it is the truth and it is the way. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts and encourage us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you would open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 17 today. And uh, let me just say a quick word. If you have not been with us or you uh, forgot where we were over the course of the last few weeks because of the chaos, um, we've been going through a study of 1 Peter. And 1 Peter wants us to know a few things. Uh, and the section that we're covering right now is sections 11, verses 11 through 20 of chapter 2. And in this section, we're told over and over by Peter how we conduct ourselves or how we are to conduct ourselves as sojourners uh, or strangers or exiles in a foreign land. 
And this is the world that we live in is that foreign land. It is the exile world that we live. We're citizens of heaven, but we're also citizens of this world. So Peter helps us to navigate that. What does that look like? And so we've talked about that over the last couple of weeks. And then we've also started this study uh, last week on how we are to conduct ourselves as citizens. I think this is a very timely message. This is nothing, uh, something that we created new or a new sermon series in light of the coronavirus that is going along or going around. But in, in God's timing, he has had us go through how we should act as citizens, how we should conduct ourselves in light of what the uh, authorities who are ordained by God hand down things that we should obey and how we're to respond to that. And so I think that this is a very timely message. And I think that we'll see some of that moving forward. We certainly, as Christians, don't act like who we were before. At least hopefully not. We're changed. We're a new creature new creature in Christ, a new creation. But we also don't live with uh, a chip on our uh, shoulders uh, to say that because we're citizens of a different world, that we don't have to be good citizens here. That's just the opposite. Because we're citizens of a different world, we want to be good citizens here. It's not that, it, that the rules don't pertain to us. We want to abide by the rules because they are God-ordained. And if we are going to silence the critics and win the lost, a good character or a good conduct is what is in order and what needs to be uh, lived out. So um, Peter tells us this very important issue is at hand and that this is the will of God. Verse 15 of chapter 2 says, this is the will of God. And this, our testimony, this life we live out is a very, very powerful, effective evangelism tool to silencing the critics and evangelizing the lost. And we want to be good representations or good representatives for Christ. And so this matter of conduct really does matter. So as we picked up where we left off last week, where, what we mentioned last week, real quick to catch everybody back up to speed, is this. We said that the command in these verses is to obey or to be subject uh, to the authorities. Submit yourselves. Be subject to the authorities. So number one was, is the command that we see in the text. But then we also see the motive in the text. The motive says, for the Lord's sake. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake or be submissive for the Lord's sake. And how do we do that? By obeying the commands, by obeying the authorities that have been put in place in our lives. So we do that by obedience to Christ, but then we do it by imitating Christ himself. Christ himself also obeyed the authorities or the commands of the government as he was here on this earth. And we looked at that text, that very familiar text of where Christ has uh, been asked, who do we pay our taxes to? And he says, you give to Caesar what's Caesar's. And you give to me what's, what belongs to me. And what belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ is our hearts. And on the coin there that they would give to Caesar or to the emperor had his name on the, throne, on, the, on the coin. But on the name of believers, on the heart of believers, the name is of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we belong to him. So give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give to Christ in our hearts and our lives. So... Christ, we, uh, we uh, obey the command. We are subject to the command for the Lord's sake through obedience and then also through imitation. And when we do this, we glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so many times we talk about how we glorify, how can we glorify God by what we say and by what we do? How does that accomplish? It's by simply obeying Christ's commands, but it's also by imitating Christ. What would Christ have us to do in these situations? And when that is accomplished through us, we give God the glory and we shine the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a very good example of this, of what we're talking about in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 6, verse 8 is a, a wonderful illustration uh, of a life lived on purpose with intentionality of obeying the authorities, not causing riots, not causing confusion, not causing hardships for the government, but a life lived in submissiveness to the government, reflecting the light and love of Jesus and obeying the commands. And through this life, a, a glorification to God happens. And I want to just show us this by way of example in Acts chapter 6, verse 8. If you'll follow along with me in your Bibles, it says this. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. 
Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. That I don't know that that would be my, the, the reaction that would be on my face as I'm being a, a falsely accused of things that I have not done. If I was being falsely accused against the Lord Jesus Christ, whom I love and whom I serve, and they're saying that I am blasphemous against his name, I don't think, and I perhaps I would not think of you, that you would have a face of an angel during those times. We would have a very disgruntled look, a very harsh look about us. Uh, you'd be able to read our body language and say, he doesn't agree with what's being said. But of Stephen, even though he was a man who was full of grace and full of power, who has been preaching in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and now the accusations are against him, he sits there with this look on his face that is like the face of an angel. Well, at the beginning of chapter 7, his trial begins. If you will follow along with me in chapter 7 of the book of Acts, it says this, And the high priest said, Are these things so? And so, like in a trial, he's able to defend himself. And, and he begins this trial all the way down through the beginning of this defense that he's making at his trial. He goes all the way through the Old Testament. He takes them all the way down through the Old Testament, telling them really what they already know about their forefathers, about the prophets of old. And he says, and they are setting the way. They are proclaiming the one who is righteous. They're proclaiming the path of the Messiah that is to come. And then he also accuses them of doing the same thing that their forefathers did or that their, their past family members did, that they, uh, what they did who spoke against the Messiah. They killed those people. Uh, they killed people who spoke of the coming Messiah. They didn't like that kind of talk, so they killed them. And what Stephen is saying is you're acting just like your forefathers did. When I'm speaking clearly and truthful things about the Messiah, and here you are ready to put me on trial and perhaps do even worse to me. Well, as he gets down to verse 51, he says of chapter 7, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law and was delivered by the angels and did not keep it. So he's really getting them fired up. They're becoming more intensified in their soul and in their spirit. Now Stephen is not uh, rioting here. He's not going against the authorities. He's been given the opportunity to speak. And he is speaking. And so his defense carries on in verse 54. Uh, now when they heard these things, they were enraged. And, their gra and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open. And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. No wonder he had the face of an angel. He knew where his security was. He knew that no matter what was going to come his way, no matter what the governing authorities of the day charged him of or charged him with, that he at the end of the day was going to be in heaven with God. He had that faith. No wonder he had the face of an angel. He was looking into heaven and he sees God. He sees Almighty God. He sees the Father. He sees the Son. And seeing all the glorious things that were awaiting him. He sees the God Almighty veiled with his own human eyes. 
But then in verse 57, but they cried out with a loud voice, stopping their ears, and they rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they were stoning Stephen. He called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And then verse eight of uh, verse one of chapter eight, and Saul approved of his execution. What is all this about? I believe that it is possible possible that the stoning that Stephen went through, in the way that he lived out his obedience to Jesus Christ, the way that he imitated the Lord Jesus Christ, spoke to the apostle. Uh, to Saul, the, the future Apostle Paul. I believe that this was something that Saul would remember as he goes through his life, as he persecutes Christians, and, and then as there's a transformation on the road to Damascus, and he remembers the life lived in the life of Stephen. He remembers what was represented in the life of Stephen, how he doesn't seek to overthrow the government. There, there's, there's no rioting going on. There's none of this going on. There's no, pub, no publicity, uh, no public vengeance that's going on. No retribution. Just Stephen, a man willing to obey the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ and to live out the, the life that Jesus lived. He did this in a very peaceable way, a very obedient way that would make his Lord proud. So we have in Stephen a wonderful example, but I believe even the greatest example comes Next, with our Lord Jesus Christ, that we are to obey the governing authorities who are in our life. We're not to, to overthrow them, we're to be submissive to them. It was Christ who lived out the same type of death. He was also falsely accused, mocked. And by the way, mocked is, is with the emphasis of the New Testament, that, he, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is mocked. His name is blasphemed, he's reviled, yet he opened not his mouth. He opened not his mouth to avenge himself. He goes humbly as a lamb to the slaughter. So I believe that this spirit is the spirit that we also ought to imitate. And then in this life, the life that the Lord Jesus lived, there was a conversion. You remember the centurion who said, surely this was the son of God. Why? How does he know that? Because he watched a man who had all the authority, the rights and privileges of almighty God, Go willingly to the cross and suffer and die in a humble, obedient spirit that silenced some of Jesus' critics and brought them to the truth. So both Christ and Stephen then taught scriptures and they taught it well. Could you imagine being in a sermon that Jesus Christ himself was preaching or someone like Stephen who's so passionate and so truthful in his speaking? And it's that proclamation and it's that kind of teaching that's coupled with the, a life well lived. A life that lives out the teachings that they teach. The truth of those teachings. In other words, their conduct matched their message. So as we approach then back to our text in chapter 2, we must realize that the foundation of our testimony is our conduct, uh, is, the, is our conduct or our character, the way we live out our life. It really does matter. Our conduct, the way we live out our life, really does matter. We can't just say we're above it. We can't just say that, that no matter, we can do whatever we want to because we're not citizens of this world. We can't say that our Heavenly Father is, is preparing a place for us and we're not going to obey the laws or the commands. That's for somebody else to obey. No, we are to obey the command. We are to submit. And the motive of this is because of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's for his sake that we do this. Now, we have already dealt with the fact that we are called to live in a world that functions differently than we live in. We're aliens. We're sojourners in that world. This world is not our home. And the, the, the balance of that is that we still live in the world. We're still citizens of the United States, you're still citizens of a country or a state, and we still live here, even though our, our salvation has secured us a place in heaven. And so we don't live above the rules. We don't live like the rules don't apply to us. We live within the rules. 
we live in, uh, uh, in accordance with the rules. We don't live in contrary to the rules. Uh, and the rules I'm speaking of is the state or the local level or the government, the national level. We live within the rules that they have set up, which God has ordained. And if we go against these God-ordained governments and these God-ordained systems, then really we're going against God because this is his plan for our lives. So in verse 13, we, we submit ourselves, which is the command, for the Lord's sake, which is the motive. Now that brings us uh, to the third thing, and that is the extent. That is the extent. And by the way, if we don't submit ourselves, and if we don't uh, live this life, then we're going against the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not uh, living in accordance with his word, and that, and that brings confusion. If we're going to pro proclaim one thing, or if we're going to profess one thing about who the Lord Jesus Christ is, and then we live in a way that doesn't uh, back that up and live out that message then we're causing confusion. And that's the last thing we need to be doing. We need to live a life uh, in accordance with and not contrary to the scriptures. So we need to be clear by the way we live out our life, that we are on the, on the, word of, on the authority of the word of God living this way in a submission to the government because we believe that it is God ordained. So now number three, the extent. And this answers the question, okay, if I am to obey and I do this because God wants me to do this, then how far do we go? Well, that is answered in verse 13 also. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution or every ordinance, your, your version may say. So, so the, the term here is every human institution, not some, uh, not the majority of them, not most of them, but to every human institution. Well, what does this mean? And I want you to listen carefully because this is really fascinating uh, to me, and I, I think it will be fascinating to you as well. When the word for institution, the human institution, or the ordinances that are set up, when it's translated in the Bible, it is used in, in Scripture exclusively of the products and activities as uh, enterprises of God and not man. So as, when the Scriptures use this, this word for human institution, what it's talking about is the God-ordained human institutions. Let me give you a couple of examples. In Mark chapter 13, verses 19, it says this. For in those days, there will be such tribulation as not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. It's the same word. Ketisis is the word, also translated creature. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Who has done the creating then? God has done the creating. So what we have here in, in, in this word here, it's in its biblical usage, is a term that always refers to something that God has done. So the question then comes, how is it used with this human institutions or the uh, human ordinances here? Well, it's used here. It is it's the human institutions that are designed by God. They're created by God. They're designed by God. And we are to obey them. And we're right back then to where we were a couple of weeks ago in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter, chapter 13 verse 1 says this. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. So verse 13 then could read like this. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every God-ordained human institution. That's the application here. That's the extent then that we are to obey all of them. You don't get a pass on any of them. It's not the majority or some of them you like and some of them you don't like. No, we are to obey every human institution that is set up by God, that are God-ordained. You say, well, some of them, some of the institutions are, are not so good, really. And, and some of them are, you know, some of the judges are corrupt in our land. I understand that. But so the command still remains. Some of the judges in the Old Testament were very corrupt. Uh, they were receiving briberies and all kinds of things for, to, for people to get off on murder charges. And, and there's all kinds of corruption going on. And so we don't get to choose and pick. We're to obey them all. But the vengeance is not for us. The vengeance is for the Lord to repay and not for us. In ancient times, judges were being bribed for murders and all kinds of thing, wicked things that people were doing. But yet God's people were still called to obey them. Even Peter, the, 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 the writer of this epistle, 
would be charged by Nero and condemned to death uh, for, for being a Christian, wrongly executed under the authority of Nero. He, he hated Christians, and he was a very grotesque, immoral man. But the charge to Peter was that you're to obey that whatever institutions, whatever authority that is placed above you, even though it is Nero, a person like Nero. And, and Peter, we see, doesn't go to his death rioting. Uh, much like Stephen, he goes peacefully. Um, he's not trying to avenge his name. But notice what next. What happens next? Uh, the next phrase of verse thirteen here: "Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor, which is like the king, as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good." So we are to obey the leadership at every level. As it comes down from the top of our uh, nation all the way to the local level, even the police officers, we are to obey them. And when we do that, we are glorifying God. We are obeying God. And in this verse, we see the primary responsibilities of what government is supposed to do. It says, the governors are sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. Now, with that being said, the government doesn't always do their, the, the best job or the best effort as, as uh, punishing those who do evil. Uh, some could argue that, you know, being a criminal, they, criminal these days is kind of a lucrative thing. You go to prison and you've got a, a cot and you've got three meals a day. You watch TV and you exercise and it's not that uh, harsh of a punishment for the crime that they've done. So we can make that argument that, that they don't necessarily do the best job. Uh, at, at uh, punishing those who do evil, but you could also make the argument that they don't do the best job at uh, praising those who do good. Uh, that's not something that in our society that is seen, although it does go on in some situations where we have citizens that honor or that have that are honored and have citizens awards and those types of things. And I think we ought to do a better job at that, at honoring those who do well and also punishing those who do evil. But Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, he says, You have heard it said, uh, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Where had they heard that? In the Old Testament, for the governing authorities and not for personal uh, vengeance. Uh, Jesus would go on to say in that passage, But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. In other words, you cannot take the law into your own hands, no matter how bad of a job you think that the government is doing or what the authorities are doing. The powers that be are ordained, or that uh, the powers that are ordained of God, and they are the powers that be. And Jesus Himself goes to the cross knowing that he would be unjustly murdered without retaliation, without revile, without revoking, without any kind of vengeance of himself. He goes willingly like a lamb brought before the shears. He would go willingly. He committed himself to God knowing uh, that it was God's ordained institutions that led him to the cross. You do not step outside of God's ordained parameters of proper conduct, and, and we, we must commit ourselves to that. Find out what is the right way to act, and we want to obey the government. We want to um, not, not act in uh, contrary to what they say, but act in accordance to what they say for the sake of the Lord. So we have the command, we have the motive, and we have the extent all the way. We follow just like Christ. Uh, all of the commands, all of the ordinances, all of the gov all the things that the government passes along, we are to obey them. So the command, the motive, the extent, and now fourthly, the reason. Why should we obey and submit? We have already mentioned this, but verse 15 says this. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. For most people who are saved, we want to do the will of God. People often ask this question, well, if I just knew the will of God, I would do it. Or I've been searching for the will of God. I have this hole in my life. I have this vacancy in my life that I believe that if God would just show me what the will of God is, then I would be so much fulfilled and I would do that. Well, in this text, 
It tells us partially what the will of God is. And it's for us to obey. And by doing good, in other words, by obeying the government, by obeying the authorities, we will give glory to God. But it also says that we will silence the ignorance of foolish people. In other, the, in other words, those who are talking blasphemous about us, in other words, it gags them, right? It, it, it muzzles their mouth because we're not giving them ammo if we're acting against the government. If we're rioting and causing uh, murders and death and disobedience because we don't believe what they're doing is right, it, that's not accomplishing anything. What does accomplish something is by living in submissiveness to the government. When we're subjects to the government, it doesn't give the other people a chance to talk bad about us. It silences the ignorance of foolish people, the critics, but it also points them to God, just like, uh, just like uh, uh, Stephen does. He points us to, to the, the, by, just by the look on his face, the look of an angel. There's something different about this guy. Uh, all the other people we accused of, they try to revile. They try to, to, to fight back. They try to avenge themselves. But Stephen, he's not doing that. He preaches a message, and he lives by that same message. So the reason we live above our approach is that our witness or our testimony will reflect the light and love of Jesus and silence the critics, but also lift up the name of Jesus Christ. As was said of Stephen, that our faces will shine like an angel. There's a great example of this in Titus chapter 3. Verses 1 through 11, and I'd like to take just a moment to read that to us and, uh, and make a few comments about it. So if you have your Bibles and like to follow along with me, Titus chapter 3, we'll begin reading in verse 1. Verses 1 through 11. Titus chapter 3 says this, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. That, that's exactly what we're talking about there. There's continuity throughout the New Testament that talks about this. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show, our per to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves once were foolish in our days of uh, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. So what Paul is telling to young Titus here is this. Listen, you need to obey. You need to live within the confines of Scripture. And that, that extent is all of the law. And so as we come then to the reason here, it is so that we will silence who we were before. We once were foolish. As verse 3 says, for we ourselves were once foolish, and we were the ones making accusations against the Christians. But now we're changed. We're not that old person anymore. And we, what we need to do, what we see makes the biggest end impact on the kingdom of God is to live in submissiveness to the governing authorities because they are ordained by God. We don't need to be people who stir up division, not just among the congregation, but in our society as well. And we do this, and I believe that it will silence the critics, and it makes Christianity believable, because then they're seeing a message that, that backs up by action or by conduct. We have a message that says this, says the truth, and then we have a life that also uh, resembles and, and responds to that message for a whole picture of what the gospel truly is. And I believe that this message is making sense here to those who want to cast us in a, in a dark light. They see us not responding to their evil attacks. They see us living in submissiveness to the government and not taking vengeance into our own hands. 
And somewhere deep down within inside, perhaps they're like that Saul who watched the stoning of Stephen. Stephen, and they, they look back on that life and say, I don't know what was different about him. But there's something different about the way he responded. It was like anything I've ever seen in my life. And, I, and, and perhaps that may be the seed that as they come to a realization of their sins by the working of the Holy Spirit, that they will then turn their lives and submit their lives over to God. So this is the reason why we do this. We, have, we do this because it's the will of God. But so we have the command, we have the motive, we have the extent, we have the reason. Now, fifthly, let's look at the attitude. In verse uh, 16, it says this, Live as people who are free. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. So the first part of that statement is this. Live or act out or act as people who are free. What a statement. Act, act as free men. You as believers, you as Christians are free. Not to do whatever you want to do, but to live for God. Live as a, as a child of God. You're free to do that. You're no, you're no longer bound up in the sin that caused you to do the bad things. You're, you're free to then to serve Almighty God. You don't have to serve the flesh. You don't have to serve the wicked ways anymore. You're free. The bondages of sin are no longer all on you, and you can live as free. But we don't use our, uh, we can live as servants of God in this freedom, but we don't use that freedom to mask or to, to put a veil on us to live in any kind of evilness. In other words, we don't say, because we're Christians, we don't have to obey the law. That's the wrong attitude to have. But because we're Christians, we are going to be submissive to the law and to submissive uh, to the government that we believe that God has ordained. And to live in contrary to that law or that government is living in contrary to what God has ordained and what he has told us to do. Yes, we're free from the world. We're free from Satan. You're, we're free from um, all of our sins and we're free in Christ. We're free. I'm free. You're free. You've been free from. Uh, you've been free by the redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter one, in verse eighteen, it says, "You were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ." So you've been set free. I've been set free from what sin, and from doing the evil and wicked things that we used to do, and we're set. We're set free unto serving God. And this is all made possible by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're free from Satan. We're free from the condemnation. We're free from the world. Free to do whatever Christ commands us to do. And then the next phrase here, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil. What he simply is saying is don't, don't leverage your freedom in Christ to disobey or just simply do whatever you want to do. Don't, don't you put some mask on it that says, well, we're free in Christ. Uh, we're of another world. We're of another dimension. We'll just do whatever we want to do. We're above the law. No, that's not going to silence the critics. That's only going to give them ammo uh, to, to accuse you of that kind of life. So are we living out of evil or are we living freely in Christ? Your evil springs out of vengeance. It springs out of retaliation. It springs out of bitterness and hostility in disobedience. We have freedom to be bond slaves of God, and that freedom is worth having. So we have the motive, we have the command, we have the motive, we have the extent, we have the reason, we have the application, and this is our last point, and we'll be finished for today. Verse 17, this is kind of rapid fire, but it gets this point across here. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. Let's just take those and explain as he goes through here. Honor everyone. You know, all men and women are created in the image of God. And because they are created in the image of God, then to some degree, they are due honor universally. And of course, there were slaves at this time of writing in, in Peter's time in the Roman Empire. And Peter says, you treat everybody with honor. You respect everybody. And that's across the board. You don't treat anybody, um, you don't mistreat anybody. You say, well, I don't, I don't really agree with everything that they do. I'm not telling you you have to agree with them or that you have to like everything to do that they do. But across the board, every color, every race, every ethnicity that we need to honor all men. 
You need to not, not, not take in consideration how, where they fall on the ladder of society and that's in social norms and, and credibility. No, you honor everybody from the top to the bottom and, and with every creed, every nation, every race, ethnicity, and so on. Everybody is worthy to be honored because they're created in the image of God. The next thing he says is love the brotherhood. Now that can be easy for us to do where the former is honor everyone can be hard to do. But he puts these side by side to show us that, that uh, the, the essence of it. Or in, in other words, he says, uh, love one another just like you would honor everyone. It has the same amount of weight. It carries the same amount of weight. So you can't say, well, I'm not going to do a good job of honoring everyone because I don't, I don't necessarily like honoring everyone. Well, are, you're also commanded to love the brotherhood. Do you want to do that? Yeah, well, it's easy for me to love the brotherhood. They're like-minded. We get together. We talk. We have fellowship. Well, the same way, the same determination that you love the brotherhood, you are also to honor everyone with that same intensity. Then the next one is this, fear God. This means to have, have a healthy fear of God. To say back to God, whatever you want me to do, whatever you command me to do, I want to do that. That's what I want to be about. I want your will and I want your way in my life and not mine. God has designed our role as citizens under the authority of the government and we should reverently fear him. And out of that reverently fear, then we should obey. We should reverently fear him enough to obey and to live peaceably in this world in which we are living now. Honor the king is the last one. Honor the emperor or honor the king. Now, we don't necessarily have a king or an emperor, but we do have a president. We have vice president and we have a chain of command. And we are to honor them no matter who is in authority. And this is back to the issue. This is kind of cycling back to where he started this thing out. And he says basically this, show respect for whoever is ruling or reigning, whoever the reigning source of authority is. In our case, it's, it's not a king, like I said, but it's a combination of several entities. But we are to honor that leadership, whether we think they're, they're doing a good job or whether we're thinking that they're, they're not doing a good job. Whether we believe to, totally in all of their um, uh, things, that, that they're, the things that they run on, their platforms, or whether we don't, we still are to honor them. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God and honor the king. That's the application of these principles and how we're to live out uh, being citizens of this world, our citizenship here. We could call it evangelistic citizenship. And I hope that we'll commit to be that kind of citizen, to be one who is not trying to overthrow the government, not trying to one who is living outside the authority of the government, but one who obeys the government. Now we know from scripture what is required for us and how to conduct ourselves as citizens, all the wrongs that may go on in this society and in, throughout history will one day be corrected. All of the judges who are corrupt, all the politicians who are corrupt, all of those people who we put our lives in submission to will one day stand before Almighty, Almighty God, the judge of all judges. And at that time, he will judge them. That's his job. That's not our job. Our job is to obey, to simply obey to give God the glory by imitating him and many other good examples throughout scripture. So until that day comes, we commit, and I hope that you'll join me in committing uh, my life and to live in a manner, in a conduct worthy of the gospel. Our conduct really does matter. It makes an effect on people. And if you don't believe me, just act contrary to the scriptures and see how much talking goes on. Uh, and we don't want to do that. We want to silence the critics. And how do we do that? By living in accordance to the scriptures and not contrary to the scriptures. I want to close by saying to you this this morning. There are some things that may come down to us uh, as an institution here at Cedar Mountain Baptist Church uh, that we, de we don't necessarily like or agree with. Uh, there may be some things in the uh, future weeks or the upcoming months that may shut our doors for a prolonged period of time. And, and what, is our, what is our response going to be to that? Is it going to uh, bear up arms or to, uh, get a pitchfork or uh, a light a torch and go down to City Hall and demand that they let us have our rights? No, that's not going to do anything. What's going to make an impact, and I believe what has already made an impact in our nation, is churches willing to do things similar to what we're doing right now. 
We're willing to make sacrifices to not get together as a family, as brothers and sisters in Christ, to be willing to sit on our couches or perhaps in a recliner or perhaps at the kitchen table and be able to willing, willingly be able to meet online. And I applaud so many churches within uh, Transylvania County willing to do this for the sake of our health. And I commend other churches and other pastors for making that decision. But I hope that you will understand that this is the proper response uh, for being a Christian. We don't want to uh, overthrow our government. We don't want to talk badly about them. What we're going to do is pray for them. And I hope that you have committed to praying for our government and for the decisions that they have to make. I, I can guarantee you this and assure you this, that none of the decisions that our government, that our local officials have made, have been easy. Keeping our children home from school in, the, in an environment where they learn best is not an easy decision to make. But they have done a good job at protecting the people of the United States. So I'd like to ask you to do this. As we move forward, let's remember that people are watching. People are watching to see what the exiles or what the sojourners or the strangers in this land, how they're going to act. They say that they belong to a heavenly kingdom, that there's a, there's, there's a heavenly king waiting for them. But we are, they also say that we're to act in a way that is in accordance with the scripture. And the scripture says that we are to uh, be submissive for the Lord's sake unto every human institution. And so people are watching to see if we're going to live a life that backs up what the Bible says. So let's commit to, to do that, to obey for the Lord's sake, to be willing to do whatever we can to help others in need. I hope that you'll take this command seriously. And I hope that you'll put to uh, put silence any kind of talk about um, uh, going against government or authorities or that sort of thing. Um, I, we're just not going to do that. We're not, we don't need to be a people like that because if we do, we're going against the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So I continue to urge you to be smart, to be wise. Continue to wash your hands and practice the social distancing. All of these commands and, and, uh, that the authorities are sending down to us and guidelines and requirements that they're asking us to do, let's do that. Let's be the ones on the front line leading the cause in, in, in uh, obedience to the government. I hope to see you back real soon. When that is decided, we will let you know. And we're going to continue to communicate through our on-call system. And again, if you did not get a call about this online service, Please feel free to give me a call and we'll get you uh, added to that list. Let me pray for you and then we'll, you can be dismissed about your normal daily activities on this Sunday. And remember to pray, commit this, uh, the coronavirus and the people affected uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. Will you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are Almighty God. And Lord, it is to you who we bow the knee. Lord, we also want to live respectfully and reverently in the community, the state, in the nation that we live. And Lord, to do that, we need to be submissive to our local and um, national government. And Lord, I just pray that as we do this, people will see how we respond to this, that we're not willing to uh, revolt or we're not willing to have riots, but we live in submission because that's what the Lord Jesus Christ has commanded us to do. And Lord, I pray that there will be changed lives uh, that come at, that come out as a result of this coronavirus. Lord, I, I pray that there will be changed lives as a result of what how people view Christians and how we respond to what's going on. Lord, I pray that we would be on the front lines of obedience. I pray that we would be on the front lines of doing what we can for our neighbor and in that fulfilling what the Bible teaches in loving God and loving neighbor. Lord, we love you. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. And Lord, we believe that he is the only way to Almighty God. And Lord, we look for his return and we await eagerly for that return. Be with us this week. Lord, I pray that you would be with those who are affected already by the coronavirus. Lord, I pray that you would see them through to good health and restore them uh, back to good health. And Lord, I pray that you would prevent this disease from going any further, that it would be stopped in its tracks, uh, that the government would uh, continue to work on this and get us uh, some vaccines and things that we can take to deter this. But Lord, we pray that it be by the almighty hand of God that you deter this virus from going any further. And we pray all of these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.